The concept and approach of habitat suitability that I presented in the last lecture has remained central to EFLOW's science and practice, but the species-specific orientation of the approach and level of effort required per species led ecologists in the 1990s to search for alternatives. The most influential product of this effort is the natural flow paradigm, which has had a profound influence on eFlow science and practice over the past two decades. The concept is based in ecological theory and holds that consideration of the full range of variation in hydrological regimes is critical to sustaining the full native biodiversity and integrity of aquatic ecosystems. The natural flow paradigm appeared at a time when natural variability concepts were being adopted in the management of a number of ecosystem types. The premises of these approaches are quite convincing. If native species are adapted to the past environmental conditions and processes in ecosystems, then the maintenance of these conditions should sustain the viability of the full suite of species in the ecosystem. Given that we still have limited understanding of the individual environmental conditions needed by most species, preservation or approximation of the known range of environmental conditions, and especially their variability, is the best management strategy. This includes preservation of disturbance processes, which were understood to exert a strong control over ecosystem structure and function. Adoption of these approaches changed approaches to managing disturbances like wildfires, which instead of being suppressed, were now accepted as serving an important ecological role. In river ecosystems, the natural variability of the flow regime was recognized as a key controlling variable in sustaining ecological integrity. You'll even hear it referred to as the master variable. The ecologically relevant components of a flow regime are the magnitude, frequency, duration, timing, and rate of change of flows. Magnitude is the amount of water, and frequency is how often a given magnitude occurs. Likewise, duration is the period of time during which a magnitude persists, whether it's a high or low magnitude. Timing refers to when a given flow occurs within different time scales, and especially the predictability or regularity of the flow level. An example of a predictable flow is a large flood that occurs each year at more or less the same time. Finally, rate of change refers to how quickly flow levels change from one magnitude to another. Together, these components of the flow regime influence the main components of ecological integrity, namely water quality, sources of energy, physical habitat, and biotic interactions. These factors are also characteristics of habitats across different river scales, so many of the habitat concepts from the former lecture apply here as well only embedded in a larger conceptual context. Flow influences water quality in many ways. The benefits of higher flows to dilute and flush contaminants in rivers is well known, although the washing of rainwaters and runoff associated with high flows may also wash contaminants into the river. Among the most serious flow-related water quality issues, and the one reflected in the photos on this slide, is dissolved oxygen. Low and sluggish flows create conditions for low oxygen levels, while higher and more turbulent flows promote aeration. Initial high flow pulses, however, may resuspend large quantities of organic matter uh, that can cause brief but harmful hypoxic or anoxic events. While harmful under certain circumstances, natural organic matter is an important basal energy source in rivers. Terrestrial sources of organic matter, like the leaves on the right, fall into rivers or are washed in during runoff events. Flows then distribute them downstream to support a well-known continuum of processes. Organic matter generated in streams and rivers is also carried downstream. Along the way, many organisms are adapted to capture this energy. The photo on the left shows nets woven by caddisfly larvae to capture fine organic material carried by flows upstream. As we learned in the previous lecture, geomorphic features in the river are the physical templates for the habitats of many species. Naturally recurring flows at predictable times from year to year create and then recreate the substrates needed by organisms. Organisms then adapt their life history strategies to make use of the available habitats at the predicted time of year. 
Examples of such habitats are in the photo on the right. The figure on the left shows the relationship between flow velocity and the diameter of sediment that can be transported. Velocity increases with increasing flow magnitude, selectively eroding, transporting, and then redepositing sediment grains as flow magnitudes rise and fall. And finally, variable flow also influences the interactions among species in the system. We still have much to learn about the full spectrum of interactions, but many are known. The photo on the right shows large woody debris that would have been washed into the river during a large flood event. This debris then becomes an important part of the structure of the river, influencing river hydraulics and geomorphology, and providing needed shelter and habitat to riverine species. As the organic matter slowly decomposes, it also releases energy transported downstream, as I showed also in a couple of slides ago. The image on the left shows a large migrating salmon exposed to predators due to the low flows in the river. It was a good day for the young Canadian wolves, but a bad day for the salmon. It's sobering to consider the extraordinary range of influences of flow on water quality, energy sources, physical habitat, and biotic interactions in river ecosystems composed of the global diversity of species. Now add to that complexity the variability in flow regimes themselves. The average flow regimes of six different rivers in the USA are shown on the slide, along with dry and wet year flow regimes from the same rivers. Differences between the rivers and between conditions in the same rivers are substantial and related to river basin size, climate variability, geology, topography, soils, and vegetation cover. Given what we learned in the lecture on micro and meso habitat suitability, imagine the research effort that would be required to develop suitability curves for every relevant trait of every species. We're far from ever having this level of empirical knowledge of all systems. But that's the beauty and allure of the natural flow paradigm. Given its role as a master variable, built into the characteristics of the natural flow regime of any river is all we need to know about the spectrum of conditions to support the adapted needs of every native species. By focusing on the controlling variable, which in many parts of the world we would have been monitoring for decades, we're able to preserve the still not fully understood dynamics of diverse aquatic ecosystems worldwide. But as with every paradigm, there are weaknesses and research gaps. We'll consider some of these in the next lecture and over the remainder of the course. But when modified to adjust to changing circumstances, the essential elements of the natural flow paradigm will remain central to best practice in eFlow science and practice. So, take home messages from this lecture. First, natural variability is important to the integrity of ecosystems. And second, in rivers, variability can be expressed by variations in the magnitude, frequency, duration, timing, and rate of change of flows. And finally, analysis of the historical record of flow variability at daily, monthly, annual, and interannual scales is a useful guide to eFlow's recommendations. That's the end of this lecture. Thank you.